All right, you just let me know when you're ready. Oh, you, it's like, go for it, man. I'm, I own the editing machine. Yeah, right on. <laughs> All right, well, welcome in, ones. Today, uh, we're going to do a little something different. So Roscoe and I have been getting a lot of questions from listeners. And so we decided that uh, on the first Friday of every month, we are going to release an additional podcast where we just take a couple questions from you guys and answer them on the podcast. So that said, if you guys have questions for anything that we're talking about, just other things that you'd like us to discuss, please reach out to us on the website at b1change1.com. You can email Roscoe or myself from there, or you can also just on the socials, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. What else are we on, Roscoe? Twitter. I, everything. I don't know. Any of the social places, too. If you want to message us there, just leave a comment. Leave us a question. We're starting to show up on Google. Yeah. If you type in B1, change one, there's starting to be some things. It, it usually takes know, six weeks or so for the SEO to kind of catch up. So. But we'll add it to the list. This is the B1 Change 1 podcast, where our mission is to help listeners to find values, practice integrity, and inspire change. Our vision is to mentor men and empower them to achieve more by taking responsibility for shaping their own lives. He's Cass, an evolving man who has been shaped by adversity and continues to grow through his imperfections. And he's Roscoe, an imperfect work in progress that tries to suck less every day. Between us, we have over 40 years of Air Force fighter pilot experience with countless hours as trainers, instructors, and mentors. Join us and learn to take responsibility for your own life as we dive into subjects from leadership to resilience to vulnerability. Be the one who changes their course. Be decisive, driven, and purposeful. Set the example for others. Lead. We wish we'd had this show when we were younger men. Be the one. In Fighter Squadrons, every Friday, we would do First Name Friday, which mm. was always... I always had to have my stripper dollars ready because I was never really good with first names. Because in the fighter squadron, you know everybody by call sign. I'm pretty sure you already owe me like five bucks. Yeah, (laughs) I'm pretty sure I do. Um, In fighter squadrons, we you know everybody by their call signs, but you hardly ever know anybody's first name. And on Fridays, everybody would wear their call sign name tag so you couldn't cheat because they don't have their full name on their uh, name tag. So we decided we'd call this, since we're doing it on the first Friday of every month, we'll call it First Name Friday. So, Paul... Yeah, Jason. It's weird. <laughs> so but weird. you know what though? There's a little bit of there's a little bit of depth to this. Yeah. And and, and I've, I feel like it warrants a little bit of explanation. So there's a, a fair amount of discipline, self discipline that goes into flying fighter jets. And one of those things that we used to really focus on was the words that we used very specific words, clear, concise, correct, calm, and cool communications, right? Saying things like six to nine and don't say the word box and all those little dumb things that we did. It was all designed to make you think before you speak because when you're in the middle of a big ass war on a single frequency, calm time is at a premium. And when you key the mic, it's a push to talk, not a push to think button. And we don't want to hear your ramblings and your trucker calm about, how you think you might be targeting the right people, dude, you got to get this shit out in as few words as possible. So I think it's, and, and alternatively the first name Friday thing, I go back to remember that movie, remember the Titans Mm -hmm. and he had, it was all the black kids and the white kids and they're really starting to intermix for the first time. And he was seeing all the friction. The coach was seeing all the friction and he tasked them with, I want you to go up to somebody of a different race every day until you've covered the entire team and learn something about them. And that kind of goes into the first name Friday too, because how many people do you know by their call signs? But I have no idea how, what this guy's first name is. Yeah, you know? and He's a puck on the scheduling board. And just for a clarification, the reason that I needed tripper dollars was because every time you incorrectly named somebody yeah. or called them by their call <laughs> sign, you owe the snack of a buck on that That's Friday. Right. So you guys screwed that up. So the idea is Q&A. So we got a couple of good questions, I think, to cover today. It's uh, probably going to go a little bit deep. The The idea is to maybe keep these episodes just a little bit shorter, but hey, who knows, man? Um, there's 63 gigabytes of space on that SD card. So let's see if we can, let's see if we can wear it out. 
All right, so the first question that we got, I'm going to read this. It's a, a text message that I got uh, a while ago, and it's from a young man, and I want to read it. I'm going to try to eliminate as much personal data from this as I can because, uh, I mean, I know this guy, but I think it frames up a discussion that we're going to have really well. So here goes. I love listening to your podcast, and please keep it up. It's nice to listen to your podcast because my father wasn't a father figure. He was more like a boss. He was never home and never helped me and my brother with anything. I always needed to learn things on my own, especially when my mom left him when I was 12 because he was a bad husband and never wanted to see her, and he filled lies in my head. He made me work at the age of 13 at a restaurant, and he made me work at Big O Tires at the same time. I always had a job as a teenager and was constantly busy. While playing baseball and football, he hated when I hung out with my friends and had any fun because he thought that that was a waste of time. I do admit the only thing about him that I learned was to have a good work ethic. I learned how to be strong physically and walking off my injuries, but never strong mentally. I still struggle a lot mentally, and your podcast has been helping me a lot with that. His question is, I'd be really interested to know how and when to continue to move forward in a relationship and when to cut ties and move on. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a tough question, too. Especially when you're talking about maybe your dad. Yeah. Yeah, or, you know, just anybody that you're close with. We've talked a lot on the podcast, yeah, especially in the self-inspection and defining values section. I think we may have mentioned a couple of different times that as you go through this process and you really start to figure out what your values are and how you want to show up in this world, a lot of that is how you show up in relationships and figuring out how you want to walk in integrity and how you do that. And I know one of the things that we've mentioned is as you go through this process, you're going to find that there's probably some folks that you have to cut ties with yeah. you know, or, or move away from. And I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty right now. I want to try to make sure that we're specific about asking or answering the question. So it's kind of two parts for me. So how to know when to continue to move forward in a relationship is the first part, right? Okay. So for you, Paul, Paul. It's fucking weird. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> um, I'm just going to pay money. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, I think it's, I think it, what is, there's three rules to being a fire pilot. One is always keep sight of the jet in front of you. And the second one was always have $5 in your pocket. Yeah, that's it. Right. <laughs> but for you, like, what do you think, or how do you know when to continue to move forward? I, I, I always look at it as you, you, there's, there's certain individuals that you want to turn towards. And then there becomes a certain point where you don't necessarily turn away, but you just start to move away. Well, I think when you break it down to its simplest form, I think that the first thing that we need to do is get around our values. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, dude, until we started this podcast and I and we started having some of these deeper discussions, just you and I offline sitting around with a cup of coffee, I really didn't give a lot of thought to that it, because it is a, it's a pretty specific thought exercise to mm -hmm. go through. And while they, I may have known it either consciously or subconsciously, I don't know that I'd ever just gone through that process and really dug down and wrote two or three pages in my notebook and tried to figure those things out. I think I always knew what they were and that's how I reacted. But I think that one of the first things that you can do if you're a young man or young lady, even, you know, and you're trying to go through this specifically towards a relationship is first of all, you got to work on yourself. Define your values for yourself and then look at the individual relationships that you have with the people around you and find out where they align or where they misalign around those values. And then there's another element to, we were talking earlier about tribes and, and how you surround yourself with your tribe and your, and your people and your trusted agents and things like that. I think there's a balance sheet at some point. And I know in, in, previous episodes, we've talked a little bit about emotional equity and where you invest that. Well, realize too that there it is a balance sheet. There's black and there's red on this sheet. And if the other party is constantly withdrawing from that account and there's a lot of red in his column, well, that may not be a relationship that you're willing to invest in. L look at it as a, as a, a stock. If you invest in a stock or mutual fund and you're not getting 
ROI on that investment, you may be better off just severing that and moving on. Now, if it's borderline and it's up and down and you're getting some sort of personal fulfillment out of it and not just constant anxiety and then I think that maybe that relationship is uh, salvageable. But it takes two to tango in this. Yeah, for sure. I would say a couple of things. So I 100% agree with you on this is one of the reasons why it's so important to define values because that will really help illuminate for you how you want to show up in relationships. I can talk from personal experience when it comes to family and I'll just say that for a long time in my life, and even today still, I struggle. I, I'm an overfunctioner. I'm I'm happy to overfunction for people. Well, what does that mean? Well, overfunction just means that, you know, I'll step in and try to make it better, try to fix it. Oh. You know, I'll I'll go above and beyond t- t- to do something to take care of somebody, to pick up the w- the weight that they can't carry. And does that go back to your early relationship with your mother yeah, and being totally the caregiver does, and yeah. all that? Okay. And so I'm a huge overfunctioner and I didn't realize that for a long time, but I recognize it now. And so I have to be very careful in relationships sometimes because I'll overfunction for people. Meaning and, you, you want to fix it. Yeah, well, or fix it or just help out. You know, I'll take yeah. on some of the stuff that they're having issues with and I'll take it on myself to help them through it or do it for them sometimes. Yeah. Depends on what the task is, right? And so... I have to be very careful with that though. So what I have to do now is I have to recognize based on my value system, how do I want to show up in a relationship? And the key piece to that is I can't be attached to outcomes. So if there's somebody that I really care about that's really struggling with something and I get into overfunction mode, I may do that stuff for them for a period of time to try to help out, to help alleviate, to help them get back on the right path, get back on their feet, whatever the case may be. Yeah. But I can't be attached to whatever the outcome is going to be. In other words, what I mean by that is at the end of the day, I still don't have any control over what their actions or reactions are going to be at the end of the day. So one of the questions that you have to ask yourself, I think, is am I doing this because I'm trying to get a specific reaction from somebody or want them to like me or hoping that our relationship will improve somehow? Or am I doing this because this is just how I've decided I want to show up in this relationship? Because those are two completely Mm -hmm. different things. And if you're attached to the outcome, I'm here to tell you right now, 98.9% of the time, you're probably going to be upset with how that outcome turns out. Yeah, disappointment. You're going to be disappointed. Yeah, disappointment's probably the likely. And And here's how I know too. So what I have to be careful about is when I go into that mode, the minute I start to feel resentment, because what will happen is with a lot of people is if you're an overfunctioner, they get used to that. Yeah. And so then it becomes an expectation that you're always going to show up that way. And you're never getting anything in return. That emotional equity, that give and take isn't there. And now I'll start to get resentful because I'm not, and that's because I'm attached to the outcomes to a certain extent, right? Yeah. And so if you're at that point where you start to get resentful about what you're doing and the effort that you're putting into it and you're not really getting any of that emotional equity back, it may be worth having that conversation with the person and just being honest and go, look, man, I feel like I'm putting a lot into this relationship and I'm not getting a lot back. Is there some way that we can find a little balance in that? Or if you just know that it's going to fall on deaf ears, well, that might be a point where it's, you've recognized that it's time to start to shift away Mm -hmm. instead of continuing to turn toward that person and to continue to show up in that fashion. Yeah. I think, I think you can apply this to friends, acquaintances, family members. I mean, there's, I've had these discussions with a few family members where I, I, and maybe this is a false expectation on my part, but I expect reciprocation out of a relationship. It's, it it takes two, like a a relationship is a two way street to me, a, a, a good, highly functional relationship where you're both getting returns on your investment, it takes both of you to be able to foster that. And if I am if I'm the one who's constantly reaching out and constantly trying to make contact, constantly trying to help you or talk to you or be a part of your ecosystem, and you're not reciprocating that, 
the sooner that I can recognize that, I think that that's probably the very first, the the first step to me anyways, of realizing that there's something, there's something going on here that I'm not getting fulfillment out of this. You know, the, the, the happiness bubble is starting to shrink on this a little bit. And that I, I just that reciprocation between the two parties is if I were constantly texting you or calling you or trying to reach out to you or trying to get in touch with you and you never once ever called me back, there's a good chance that you're probably not going to be in my main text message stream for very long. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I don't want to get off on a tangent, but the, the reciprocation piece to a certain extent, I think, can be situation dependent depending on what that person's going through potentially. Um, or like even in a relationship like a marriage, you know, we always talk about people like the standard platitude is marriage is a 50, 50 proposition. Never is. And that's bullshit. Never is. Right. The key to marriage or relationships like that, if you have them in your life is if you're at 20%, let's hope I'm at 80 so that we're hitting a hundred. Right. And being able to express that back and forth to each other. Um, I'm an introvert. And so what I mean by that is I recharge my batteries by having like alone time, not by hanging out with people or being Mm -hmm. bombarded with questions and things like that. Well, I leave on a three day trip and I come home and I've had to play Mr. Customer service and talk to people and talk to the the dude I'm flying with for three days straight about shit. I don't fucking care (laughs) about. Let's just be honest. Most of the time. These shallow, hollow, empty conversations. So, how's the weather today? Yeah, and um, I'm exhausted, you know? And so, Alicia and I have come up with a little thing where when I'm on my way home on, like, the last leg of the day, I'll be like, we got a scale of 1 to 10. And 10 is I'm on all cylinders, let's go. And 3 is I need some space when I get home. So, when I walk through the door, I don't need to hear all five things that I need to fix right now, right away, right, that broke while I was gone or you know, whatever popped up while I was gone. We just sit down and put on a movie. Yeah. You know, so, um, and she does the same for me. She gives, because she's talking to clients all day long. And so she might, she's out of words by the time I come home. That's a good take. I like that technique. And so that's one way to, to manage it a little bit, but that, that notion that, you know, relationships are always a 50, 50 proposition, I think is bullshit. It's when, when you need me to be there, I'm there. And I'm there at whatever yeah. percent you needs to help me to help you get it across the line and vice versa. That's that reciprocation piece that I'm yeah. looking for. Well, sometimes you just need to, you just need somebody to listen yeah. for a little bit. And That's right. Sometimes. And be you, empathetic. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, man, if, if you just sat there sometimes and just nodded and said, uh-huh, every now and then, that's usually enough for me because it's not about it. It's, I'm getting to a point here. It's not about you. Yeah. Right. And and the point that I was making with this young man is we, we talked on the phone a few times and he started making the comment about he wanted to reach out to these individuals who have hurt him and cut him deeply in his very young life. And he wanted to find a way to fix them so that their relationship could get back to what he thought was normal or, or remembering the good old days when they used to hug each other and, and shake hands and smile and laugh. And. I went, hold up, dude, full stop. You can't fix him. You're not going to be able to fix that dude because he may not be ready for that. Yeah. The only person that you can focus on in this is yourself. Are you getting fulfillment out of this relationship? Does this relationship align with your values and where you think you're going with your life? If the answer is yes, keep fostering it. Keep keep helping out. If the answer is no, maybe that's when you start to look at cutting ties. He may not be there. That 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 young man, the people in his life, they've moved into different phases of their lives individually. They're surrounded by different people. They don't all live in the same house and see each other every day anymore. All of these things factor into how strong is that relationship. And we saw it, man, when, when we would go to a new base and you're introduced to these 30 or 60 guys in a fighter squadron, you hit it off with a couple of them. You spend the next three years hanging out every weekend and then you move away and you never talk to that individual again. Well, how deep and how rooted was that real relationship? You and I were in a squadron for two years together and we're sitting here. What is it? Seven, eight years later. That's a deeply rooted 
that, that, I mean, that relationship was, it had roots, man, yeah. and it grew and, and we both fostered it along the way, but we've known people for, I mean, I've known people for a full three year assignment, hung out with them almost every freaking weekend. Our wives hung out together. Our kids played together. And then you move away and you never speak again. That is not a deeply rooted relationship. Yeah. Maybe that's one that you, you just move on from. Yeah. And that's where we've talked about too, is like setting appropriate boundaries. So I've had family members in my life who I love deeply, who I definitely overfunctioned for, did everything I could to manage and maintain and try to improve the relationship, at least from my perspective, and was continuously treated like shit. And the expectation just became that I can treat you however I want. You're going to continue to show up. You're going to do what I need you to do. You're going to help me with whatever I need help with. And it doesn't matter how I show up in the relationship. This is, and what happens is, is if you stay in that pattern, that's what the pattern becomes. And so I had to start setting really specific boundaries and just starting to say, it's okay to say no. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? No, I'm not going to do that for you anymore. I'm not going to show up like that until I get a little bit of reciprocation back Mm -hmm. or at least some kindness every once in a while. Then this is over. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to stay in this cycle with you because it's not good for me. I'm just going to end up getting resentful yeah. and then I'm not going to like you anymore. And then where are we at? Right. Well, I go back to so, that, but go back to the ledger analogy. Right. And, and I don't know if I fully developed that metaphor, but there's red and there's black on both sides. Yep. And, and you, you see this in our marriages, right? There's, there's things that your wife does that irritate you. And that goes in a little bit of red in their column. Well, there's things that you do that irritate her, and that's red in your column, you know? And and I think at the end of the day or at the end of the week or year or whatever your measuring stick is, I think you would kind of want those blacks and those reds in the individual columns to kind of balance each other out. If she's having a bad day, you'd be there to help her, and you would expect that if you're having a bad day, she's there to help you and, and vice versa. But at the end of the day, I go back to kind of that one of five principle, keep your circle small and then build out from there. Surround yourself with people who you resonate with people who share your common interest, maybe share your common goals, people who will reciprocate those relationships, foster those relationships and anyone else, man, they're outside of your sphere. Just focus on the five or, or seven guys that really matter to you that give you happiness and fulfillment. If your relationships are causing you anxiety and depression, that's probably a key indicator that you need to move on from those. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would also say that just being 50 years old, one thing that's been true in my life is that most relationships have a season to them. Uh, You're going to be very lucky if at my age you have more than two to five dudes in your circle that you have maintained a relationship with over the course of a very long amount of time that you're still very close with and that, you know, you can call it the drop of the hat and they're going to be there for you. Um, Family members may be the same way too. And family's the same way. And that was, that was going to be my next point. And I think that's one of the harder things to recognize when you're a kid, Mm -hmm. right? Because we have this social or cultural belief that like family's supposed to be tight and we're all supposed to be close. And, and most of, and for most of us, that's bullshit. Yeah, it is for me. So to me, it's more my tribe, right? It's what we, you were talking about with the tribe analogy. And that that family can be anybody, right? Family can be whoever you make it, whoever you choose yeah. to be in that That's trust tree, that circle of trust. That's a real good point, right? Man. It can yeah. be whoever you It doesn't pick. necessarily have to be your blood. It doesn't have to be yeah. blood. That's good. It's, um, more of a, it's more of a mentality well, around those, those so relationships. Sometimes yeah. you have to make a mindset shift and just recognize that Family is who you choose. Family mm-hmm. is who you choose to be close with. Family is who yeah. you know you can have those reciprocal relationships with. Those are the people that are going to be good yeah. for you in life. They're going to be close, and they show up with you. Just they show up for you, just like quote unquote family members should. Yeah. When times get tough and things like that, so uh, that's what I would say to that. Yeah, for for you know the young man in particular, if he's listening, and and for anybody else, I think that's maybe suffering from a little bit of this. And, and let's be honest, man, we all do at some point. There's going to be somebody that you thought you were very close with. I can't tell you how many best friends Katie has had over yeah. her over her course. And, and eventually you just realize that maybe you weren't best friends. Maybe you were best friends in that moment for that couple of years or, or whatever that season was, like you said, to use your terms. And then you moved on, you know, and, and that, that doesn't mean that that relationship didn't have value at the time. 
Absolutely. Maybe that was your coping mechanism. Maybe that was your, maybe that was your sounding board. Maybe that, that relationship helped you get through a really hard time mm-hmm. in your life. And, and you really needed that person for those, for that finite amount of time. And then you both kind of moved on and maybe you found somebody else that's, that's filled that role. The important piece is I think to find a tribe, find somebody that fills that role, realizing that, you know, in a few years you may move on. Yeah. I, I, I don't keep in touch with a single person, not one person that I went to high school with. Me neither. Not one. And But I mean, I went to school with these kids from the time I was like eight years old for, for 10, 12 years, we were, and I went to a really small school. I graduated with 19 people. Wow. They, very tiny school. Like we knew each other. Okay. We were like brothers and sisters because we'd known each other since we were seven or eight years old, graduated. And then we all kind of went our own ways. And I don't keep in touch with a single person that I, have I went to high school with. a couple friends from high school that I, you know, have seen or that I message with on social media every once in a while, but they're not, I wouldn't consider it all close friends at this point. They're not the people that I would call. Yeah. I might share a message with them once every few years, but I'm not going to call them if I'm in trouble. So. Yeah. And the other thing that I would just point out before we kind of recap this, because I think it's kind of going to be kind of important to go back and recap it for just a second. Paul. It's so brutal to say, um, you notice I haven't even tried yet. Jesus, I'm just, yeah. Use generic terms. Yeah. Is, um, (laughs) at least for me and my experience, when I started doing this kind of self-inspection values work 10, 12 years ago, there, I, I started to have this recognition around relationships and boundaries and how do I want to show up and all of that stuff. And, and, and guess what? There were a lot of people who I just kind of had to slowly let the door close on because it wasn't reciprocal. It was very kind of superficial and, yeah. and in many ways in a, in a lot of uh, instances want very one-sided. So I'm a good listener. And so people will call me and vent and want to talk. And then all of a sudden I'll need them and they're nowhere to be found. Right. And so you'll, you'll start to see those things and, and that's okay. It's okay to pivot away and to start to seek and, and look for those folks that yeah. can be that one of five example in your life or person in your life. Mm-hmm. So I would just say to, to kind of wrap up this question, how do you know when you continue to move forward in a relationship and when to cut ties and move on? Step one is defining your values and Agreed. figuring out how you want to show up. Yeah, once, you've, once you've done that, then step two is show up in that relationship in a way that aligns with your value system. But don't be attached to the outcomes. And if you find yourself getting attached to the outcomes, it's probably time at that point to start setting some specific boundaries or having conversations and then setting boundaries with that individual. And then if you're not getting that reciprocation, if that emotional equity is completely one-sided, that's when it's time to move away and moving away. Isn't fuck you. I'm done with you. I'm never want to see you again. Right. That's not what we mean. It's okay to just pull back, pull back Yeah, to just slowly move away. You know, you may find that just that simple act of pulling back highlights that to that individual. And they're like, dude, where have you been? Well, I mean, I've been here this whole time. And maybe that rekindles it a little bit. Maybe it doesn't. But the three th- the three takeaways that I would say to wrap this up is along the same lines is, one, keep your circle small. You've got these trusted agents in your life that you're going to share different things with, but keep your circle small. Recognize a foundational relationship, a foundational f- um, friendship or a marriage versus an acquaintance uh, and and what values those hold and what weight those hold in your life. And then the other piece is you can only focus on yourself. You can only, you can only focus on what you can do here. And, and, you know, talking to these young men, I've had a couple of them say, well, you know, I just wanted to make my daddy proud. All right, fuck that. You do you, man. Do you and do it well and improve yourself and keep reaching for the stars and your dad will be proud. Yeah, make yourself proud. That's, Everybody else will be too. Only focus on you and let that focus, this is my third main point, let that focus on yourself and your own self-improvement influence the other people, all right? And you don't have to walk around, we, we've said this before, you don't have to walk around carrying a big stick and a shield that says, I'm improving myself. No, they'll notice. They right? will They'll notice in five years from now, when you've got a master's degree and a six figure job and a hot wife, those people who had forgotten about you in your earlier lives are going to look and go, Oh shit, what did this guy do that I didn't? All right. So just focus on you. All right. All right. Next question. You're so much, so much a better Roscoe than you are a Paul. (laughs) I guess, I guess that's a compliment. I don't know. All right, so this other question comes from another young man, 
who's in ROTC with Caleb up at Ember Riddle. And, you know, for perspective, these young people, some of them have never been exposed to the military at all. They maybe they thought ROTC was just a cool thing to do, or they're trying to find their tribe or, or something like that. It's new, exciting. There's a whole eclectic melting pot of people to hang out with. That was one thing that stood out to Caleb was how many different people there were in this thing. So with that in mind, these young men are potentially starting what may be a long military career. And the question says this, was your dad ever away from home when your mom was pregnant? And before you say that's a weird question, it's a precursor to my actual question for him. What was the emotional stress like being away from home, knowing he had a kid on the way and he might not make it back home? Solid, dude. From from an 18-year-old kid, that's that's a little bit of, that's kind of deep. That's a deep question for sure. So I don't have any personal, like all my kids were, I wasn't in that situation where I had a pregnant wife at home when I went on a deployment or something like that, but I had young kids and I really don't know if there's a difference. Yeah, well, I think that fear of or the anxiety around not being home, period, for long stretches of time when you're on deployment cycle and being able to help out your wife or just all the the little things that you're missing in your kids' lives while you're gone is always there. I was never deployed when my wife was pregnant, but I did. I was at officer training school when I found out that my ex-wife was pregnant with our first child. And so like a month into OTS, uh, I think we talked once a week, usually on Saturday. And then otherwise it was writing letters back then. There was no, yeah, gosh, right? there was no Remember video that? cams or anything like that. One phone call or a week cell phones and, that you could yeah. do video calls with. Katie but, still has all those letters that I sent her. Yeah. When, Cause I went to, um, I went to allied force in Kosovo. I was, we were operating out of Aviano and it was, snail mail yeah with stamps and shit yep. and one phone call a week yeah well even on my tours in iraq it was getting phone cards and going to the one hooch that had the you know 15 phones around yeah. the outside wall and you'd pick it up and do international dial you'd set up times that you were going to call and you know you talk two or three times a week but that was about it and um, those those calling cards had like it was like 20 digits yeah and you get to like the 19th digit and you fat finger it and you're Fuck, I got to start over. Yeah, it was such a pain. <laughs> so it's it's tough. I mean. Well, I think in the end, I, I and maybe this will help us frame the discussion. I think that there's two parts. All right. One, for, for the member who's maybe deployed or not present in the family, the immediate family structure, there's always going to be a feeling of helplessness to a degree. When something goes down with your significant other, the washing machine breaks, the car, something happens with the car. And, and here's a, here's a rule for all you young men who are thinking about going into the military. There is a rule out there that if it can go wrong, it will go wrong when you're on a deployment. Yeah, when you're Nothing breaks when you're at home in garrison, everything is going to break when you're gone. So there is a little bit of a feeling of helplessness there. And we can talk about the preparation required when we get to that. But the other piece of it is, I think, there has to be a, a certain level of compartmentalization in in both of you, all right, in, in the person staying at home and the person deployed. I think you have to be able to compartmentalize these feelings and these, these thoughts so that you are 100% focused on your mission so that you don't make mistakes and, and break the wrong things or kill the wrong people. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was also, I, my first assignment to Korea, which was a remote assignment, I left for Korea when my daughter was four months old. And I didn't see her for 10 months because I was over there when 9-11 wow. happened. And so all the all the leaves got canceled. So you got back and she was walking. And, I got back and she yeah. was, you know, over a year old. She didn't even know who I was. That's crazy. You know, she didn't even have a, I don't think she had a memory of me. So, yeah, that stuff's tough. The first piece of it is the preparation piece, though. I think that's one thing that can help alleviate some of that anxiety. And it depends on what service you're in and probably what rank you're at or what kind of, you know, uh, fighter squadrons were a little different, I think, than a lot of other units potentially because it was just such a tight-knit unit. And the wives group always did a good job of 
kind of looking out for each other and helping take care of each other. Yeah. And showing up and helping out when we were gone and on the road, which was always a huge benefit, I think, for the guys when we were overseas. I think we saw that a lot when I was a crew chief, too. Yeah. Uh, Katie had a pretty good support structure of spouses uh, in the in the crew chief world. Yeah. So that's what I would do is the first thing is, is try to build a support structure around your family for while you're gone that you know is going to be able to really help when the dishwasher does break or the washing machine stops working or the sprinklers stop working or whatever it yeah. is around the house that needs that they're going to need help with. I know I remember one assignment in particular to Shire Force Base, the Squadron Wives had put a little booklet together of like all of the service places in town. And it was everything from, you know, electrician, plumber, yard service to doctors and dentists and orthodontists and everything. And it was all the recommended places to go. So I think that's the first thing that you can do that can help alleviate some of that. I mean, nothing's going to make it all go away. And I'm just going to be honest for guys that actually go through this and go downrange and deploy. There's days where it just fucking sucks. Yeah, that's valid. You know, you're worried about things or, or you're just missing everybody. Yeah. Home what is, is yeah, a thing. What you're missing. Well, you know yeah. what you're missing out on at home, watching your kids grow up or being able to be at your son's first football game or baseball game or, yeah. you know, whatever the case may be, your daughter's first basketball game or volleyball game or whatever it is. Right. It's just, it sucks being away for that stuff. But having a plan and having some preparation up front will definitely help. Other than that, once you're downrange, I think you have to have maybe thought about, and this is, I think, diff- more difficult to do when you're younger than when you get a little bit older. You kind of get into a, a battle rhythm after you've done it a few times. But also having some coping mechanisms for yourself, you know, whether that's working out, whether that's, religion and church if that if that's what works for you i used a journal that journal was a lot of guys yeah. a lot of guys journaled actually yeah. people would be surprised but a lot of guys journaled um, it's good therapy man yeah it really is yeah. and and it's something you can reflect back on well that's and just relive it. those memories and that's what i was yeah. going to get at next and was yeah. you know mindfulness if if you've never learned a mindfulness practice it might be worth looking into yeah. and i know a lot of guys out there especially they're younger like mindfulness fuck that blah 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 oh, it's, dude it's I wish I'd have started doing it when I was 18. Yeah. I really do. I, I do too. I, 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 I see some guys on, on the YouTubes that have kept journals since they were like 15 years old. And they've got these big these big black leather books with each year labeled on them. And they can go back and relive through some of that stuff. And you start to see this character arc of your own life. And yeah. I, I just I wish that I would have done more of that when I was younger. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but there's a bunch. Of, my point is, is there's a bunch of things that you can do downrange to allow yourself to to work through mm-hmm. that stuff. You know, even as far as... The other thing I would point out, too, is when you're downrange and you're going through those things, you're not the only one that's going through it. There's... I would guarantee you almost that there's probably another guy in your squadron or in your unit that is going through the exact same thing. So identify those guys and maybe sit down together once a week and, you know, have coffee or a soda or whatever. And, yeah. and dude, how you doing? How's things going at home? What are you going through right now? Are you doing okay? And have those conversations and just get some, have an opportunity to vent, get some of that off your chest. Again, chaplains are good for that if you're mm-hmm. in the military. So go see your chaplain and talk to, talk to them about it. Yeah. They'll, they'll be able to give you some support and maybe even some, some other coping skills potentially around that stuff. There's, there's different outlets that you can use, but then the, the next piece of that is compartmentalization, especially if you're, on the pointy end, if you're a frontline kind of cat, you have to learn how to compartmentalize in order to get rid of the distractions. Because once you strap on the jet or whatever it is that you're doing, you've got to be intently and completely focused on what's about to go down. Yeah. So that you don't hurt yourself or hurt somebody else or fuck something away. So you got to learn how to compartmentalize. And I'll let you talk about that a little bit. Well, I want to go back to a couple of things that you, you were talking about that, something on the preparation line is this is why it's important young people to have routine maintenance practices around your house, on your cars, um, on your relationships. You know, this is why this stuff is important. Don't let your automobile atrophy to the point where it could just break down at any moment. Maintain those routine maintenance practices around some of these things to help mitigate as much of that as you can. Parts are going to fail. Shit's going to happen. 
But if you're the type of guy who hasn't changed the oil in his car for six years, there's a high likelihood that as soon as you deploy, that car is going to fail. Yep. And and now you're in a, in a pickle. And I mean, we had a washing machine go out one time when I was gone. Um, my wife tells this funny story about she had a check engine light come on in her car. She called one of her uh, one of the husbands who had stayed back and she starts explaining it to him. And, and he was like, uh, I gotta be honest. I don't know shit about cars. So maintaining a list of people who mm-hmm. have different skill sets, maybe, uh, kind of goes in line to what you were talking about with the little book and whatnot. Katie had, uh, we had forged some relationships and made some contacts and gotten this information and, and kind of made these packs with these other families. And she called them her rent a husband's, while I was gone, she knew who she could call for various different things. If she needed emotional support, she could call these people. If she needed fixing around the house, helping move you know, furniture or whatever it was, she had these resources already kind of pre-planned. And this goes into, you know, if you go to my website and you start looking down, I got what I called the three Ps, and it was plan, posture, perform. And this goes into that posturing phase, right? So I'm starting to put the chess pieces on the board and getting them where I want them so that when I need them, they're there. Maybe I don't need them, but I'd, I'd rather have them there just in case rather than something bad happens and now I... I'm having to play pickup ball. Yeah, and the the good point in that is, you know, if you're getting ready to spin up for deployment and you've got a leaky faucet or a toilet that's running or... Fix that shit now, Yeah, like, fix it, man. Like, get a list going. Get all that stuff fixed and squared away before you walk out that front door. And uh, that'll help give you a little peace of mind. And it'll help, hopefully, prevent your wife from having some kind of a significant issue while you're downrange. Well, you were talking about the compartmentalization and, and the specific question was handling the emotional stress. And, and I think those two kind of go hand in hand. And a technique that I used on a deployment, I was on a nine month deployment and nine months away from home is a long damn time. Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, and there's just, there's just no easy way to cut it. And, and deployments have, they have peaks and valleys, but generally speaking, when we show up, when I'd leave the house, kiss the wife goodbye, leave the house with all my gear from that moment until about three weeks in maybe was super exciting because you're, you're, you're just in constant go mode. You're learning all the new rules. You're learning the procedures, the SOPs, all those things. SOPs is standard operating procedures. Thank you, Jason. But it's exciting for about three weeks. And then the mundane starts to happen and it's kind of like groundhog day every day. You know, I get up, I take a shit, I put my flight suit on, I go fly, I come home. You know, one technique that I used in the past was I would try to break up my day into like two hour chunks. So I'd get up, get up in the morning at whatever time. Uh, I had a, 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 I had a pretty steady battle rhythm as far as I had a, a meeting every morning at eight o'clock with the, the battle group that I had to go in and sit in with. So I'd get up at 6.30, get dressed, go have my coffee, eat some cereal or whatever, maybe chat with Katie for just a few minutes. We had a, like a Facebook chat that we utilized pretty good because it was late, late at night, her time, and I still wasn't quite awake yet. But that gave me a chance to kind of, you know, get my day going and whatnot, go to the meeting, and as soon as the meeting was over, I'd go hang out with some, uh, some of the other Bubba's in the in the fire cell, we drink coffee, tell stories, maybe solve a couple problems here and there. And then I'd go back to my, my office, do a little bit of work. My next event was lunch about two hours away. So I, I was breaking up my day into these little, these little routines, go gather up the dudes, go eat lunch, come back, play some video games at two o'clock. We went to the gym, go to the gym for a couple hours, play some basketball, um, lift some weights, do some running on some treadmills or, or a lap around the base or something like that come back, shower up. Now it's dinner time. Go eat dinner with all the bros, come back, watch a movie. And then you wind down for the end of the day. And I think that that having that battle rhythm every day in these little two hour chunks, they're not so far out that you can't focus on them. They're not so close in that it's so rapid fire. You can't really focus. So I think that something like that really helped me manage just my day to day. And yeah, it's groundhog day, but it's a routine. It's something that's easy. It's repeatable. And it just made time go by really quick. Yeah. And then when you get to about the, you're about 60 days out from coming home, that's when you start to get a little bit excited about the RTB, returning home, getting yeah. back into that, like that family thing. 
And that's when you, you start to really get uh, anxious may, may not be the right word. Maybe it is, but you start to, you start to anticipate, well, what's it going to be like? Yeah, I get excited. What's she going to be like? What am I going to be like? How, you know, are the kids going to remember me? Are the dogs going to remember me? Those kinds of things. So there's about 60 days in there where you got to think about that kind of shit too. Yeah. And in that 60 day window, I think it's really important to start talking to your wife, especially if you've been gone for any amount of time as to what reintegration is going to be like, because here's the thing that's difficult for most guys, especially on their first deployment is you leave. And when you get back, you, you remember the routine that you were in before you left. Oh, but she's been doing that routine's gone. That's right. She's been holding the fort down the whole time. That routine is completely and now fucking gone. You were not part of and that. And now you are a That's monkey right. wrench into the routine yep. that she has gotten herself into and what she's been doing for all that time that you've been gone. So you got to have those conversations and talk a little bit about how, okay, where do, what are, what's going to yep. be the division of labor? Like, how do, how do I fit back into this picture? Because if you if you have the expectation that you're just going to come walking in the door and all of a sudden daddy's home and <laughs> you're just going to pick up where you left <laughs> no, off. Hold up. You, I got a, you're I got, a, I got a you're funny a dumb sto- motherfucker. <laughs> I got a funny story about that. So uh, this was a six month. Actually, we did it twice. We tried to surprise the kids. And let me tell you, it's not like it is on TV. It never fucking works that way. All right. So on one of them, Katie... Katie picked me up from the airport in Nashville, drove me back home, and it's late at night. It's, I don't know, 9, 10 o'clock or so. My kids are little. I think Caleb was maybe six at the time. And she goes up and knocks on the door and says, hey, I got a surprise. She she had called him and said, I'm on my way home. I got a surprise for you. And so she goes up to the door and knocks on the door. The kids come out there, and Caleb's, like, wrapped in a blanket, wiping sleep out of his eyes. The other kids are, like, getting off their video games going, what, what, you know. And I jump out of the car and be like, hey, kids, how's it going? And Caleb looks over and goes, oh, we thought you were a pool. And walk back in. Like, <laughs> well, fuck me. All right. Well, welcome home, Dad. Yeah. All right. So fast forward a couple of years, I go on another deployment. I come back home. Same kind of thing. She comes up, picks me up in Nashville. We went, and Katie and I got a hotel room that night in Nashville because it was like midnight or something. Got up the next morning. Oh, by the way, that's a whole other story. Uh, you think that you're going to come back and you're going to reintegrate back to this relationship that you left. And let me tell you, it's a little uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's almost like meeting that person for the first yeah, time. Starting again. over again. It, it is. To and a certain extent. There was no hanky panky going on in the hotel room that night. We were laying there in bed, just trying to learn how to talk to each other again, face to face. It's, it's really weird. All right. So the next morning we get up and we come back home. Same kind of thing. She calls him, says, hey, I got a surprise for you, da-da-da. Go up, and instead of her knocking on the door this time, I went up and knocked on the door, and I dick, 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 knock on the door, and Caleb answers the door. Nikki's standing right behind him. He opens the door and looks up, sees that it's me, and he goes, hey, Dad, I lost a tooth. And it was like I was never gone. It was just like I went to work. Yeah. That It was so weird. And then they started telling me how Mom was cheating on me with her boyfriend, which got a little that got my ears perked up a little bit turns out she had been calling adam levine her her boyfriend this whole time and you know they're young kids whatever yeah but never like it is on tv no so that reintegration piece is important and then i just want to circle back to compartmentalization real quick because it's it can be a healthy defense mechanism for moving through things like that, but you have to be careful with it too, because if you just go, okay, well, family's going in a box for the next six months and I'm not going to think about it or worry about it or let myself have any emotion around it. That can be a bad thing. Yeah. So it's okay to feel homesick. It's okay. And that's where I think journaling or I used to write letters all the time, you yeah. know, when I'd have those days or whatever, I'd get back to my hooch and I just write a long letter to yeah. a kid, to my wife, to whoever, just write a long letter and then throw it in the mail the next day. And that was a good way for me to help get some of that out of my system as I move through it. I think that reach back is important. You know, not don't put them in a box and forget about them for six to nine months. That reach back is important because while you miss them and you're in an austere environment and maybe you're feeling isolated and lonely, they're at home, maybe feeling the same things. Yeah. I mean, your wife is going to bed in a cold bed every night. She doesn't have, 
you know, y'all don't sit there and watch the TV show and laugh anymore. And, and the kids can't look over and see you on third base calling the pitches, you know, so it's, it's affecting all of you. So I think keeping up that communication is super important. And then as we start to wrap this one up, I would, I would really want to leave on this one. And it, I sound like a broken record when I start talking about the individuals, the individuals, the individuals, but you really can't compare yourself to other people when you're in this environment. If you're, if you're deployed with a bunch of bros in a fighter squadron, you really can't compare yourself to the other guys and go, well, they seem happy all the time. Why am I feeling down and depressed? Well, maybe this is their sixth deployment and they know how to cope with this stuff. And maybe yeah. it's your first one and you just don't know how to do these yeah, things. Or yet. maybe they don't like their go wife and they're happy to, to be gone. <laughs> yeah, go talk to them and find out, hey, man, you seem to be dealing with this stuff very well. And, and I'm having some issues here. The, gosh, man, we've said it a thousand times. The ability to raise your hand and ask questions or say, I'm fucked up. God, that's a superpower, man. Yeah. Learn to go and lean on these people and be that be vulnerable about some of these some of these discussions. Because he may have a really cool coping mechanism yeah. that maybe he gets up every morning, goes for a five mile run, and it just gets his day going or something like that. You just don't know. And that could be the start of a great friendship too, could like be. we were talking about in the previous question. Absolutely. Right? Could so, be. Maybe you find common ground and you found yeah. out a little bit about each other. I think you'll be surprised, especially in the environment that we were in, if you're in a similar environment, how often guys will lend a hand and help up, then yeah. guys will actually like think that you're stupid or mm-hmm. shame you or anything yeah. something like that. Like we're there for each other. Well, I have some civilian friends that are, they're not used to being away from their significant others. So when that, maybe that wife goes back to visit family for a couple of weeks during the summer, they kind of roll and pull and you know, they're, they're living off of cold ham and cheese sandwiches or just kind of go into a funk for a couple of weeks because they don't know how to operate. I think we get more accustomed to that yeah, in the military we because we, we spend a little bit of time on the road and, and for long chunks at a time, I mean, you go, you might go to a red flag piggyback to a WIC support and you're in Vegas for six freaking weeks, yep. man, which isn't technically a deployment, but it's still six weeks away from home. Yep. So I think we get a little more accustomed to that. And Katie's in Alabama right now. She's she's going to be gone for ten days, and I'm okay. Yeah. I'm I mean I'm enjoying some quiet time around the house and yeah. reading and getting some stuff done. And yeah, and it builds a fair know. amount of resiliency for everybody involved too. Like yeah. I know I know my kids are probably uh, more resilient because of those dynamics than yeah. a lot of their friends who just you know always had mom and dad around ever were. So yeah. So to tie it up and put a bow on it, I'm I'm going to leave on. Um, Find a good battle rhythm to where you can make your days go by pretty quick. Something that's repeatable, something you can look forward to. I think smaller chunks are better than bigger chunks. Don't compare yourself to other people. Keep that, you know, keep that perspective that maybe these people have dealt with this before and I haven't. Yeah. Maybe this is an opportunity for me to go ask questions and learn. And then, you know, we didn't really mention this, but I'll mention it now. It's when you are home, make those moments count, you know, Go to all the practices. Yeah. Go to the choir and the Get recitals and, and 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 really invest the time that you can. I think that Katie will tell you and, and maybe even my kids will tell you that, yeah, I was gone a lot, but when I was home, man, I was there. I was I was in it. I was a family dude. I went to all the stuff. I I would break my back to make it to a practice or to be in the in the back of the room when they're doing their stupid choir thingy or whatever it was, because I was trying to invest in them and let them know that, man, I'm on your team and I got you. Yeah. I would say number one is before the deployment, prepare and get a good support structure around your family. And then two, once you're gone, you're not going to be able to completely negate any of the emotional aspects of this. It's going to happen. So find a good battle rhythm, have good coping mechanisms. Don't just compartment, you compartmentalize when you have to, but don't just compartmentalize it all the way. And then, Think about what that reintegration plan is going to be when you're coming home. Have that conversation with your significant other. And once you come home, be patient with that. Yeah. Like have a little grace around it because you're the new addition to everything that you are, dude. You're the the new addition to everything that they've been doing their own way for the last six to nine months. So Just like you built a battle battle rhythm, they built a battle rhythm. Exactly. That's cool, man. Hey, for our first Q and A, our first like real Q and A, first first, first Friday. Friday, Jason, that was pretty good. Good job, Paul. Um, I 
what I would what I would encourage people to do is, you know, realize that the things that we're talking about and the stories that we're telling here are not unique. Mm-mm. They're not special. Everybody goes through this at one point or another. So if you have questions, send them in. Go to the website. There's a contact me form on there, and you can send it. It comes directly to us in an email. You can go to, on to any of the socials, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and look us up, Be One Change One Podcast, yeah, and s- send us send us some, some cool questions, man. We'll try to break them down, tell some good stories around that, and maybe we can share some tips and tricks to help people win in the future. All right. Anything else? No. Be, be the, the one. one. Be the change. Thanks for flying with the Be One Change One podcast. If you got something out of this show, then be the one and share it in your circles of influence. You can be our wingman through our website at www.b1changeone.com. That's B and the number one, change and the number one, dot com. We invite you to be the one and join our fighter squadron on social media at B One Change One on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can follow us at Paul Roscoe White on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, as well as Roscoe's website, www.paulroscoewhite.com. You can email us from the website and please leave comments, share, and ask questions, or leave ideas of things you would like to discuss on future podcasts. Most importantly, be the one that helps us win the algorithm by leaving a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining. Until next time, be the one.